What's going on everybody? It is Triple Crown 24 back today and one of the most common questions that I get asked in my PSA submission group that I have with Mike O. Link in the description down below if you're interested. Uh, but this comes from all different levels of, of collectors and hobbyists who want to get into grading is should I grade this card or some kind of variant of it like is this card grade worthy? What types of cards should I grade? to grade or not to grade, that is the question. And that's the question I'll be answering today. But of course, this is just my opinion. I'm not telling anyone how to collect. I'm not telling anyone how to grade cards. I'm not saying you have to do uh, what I'm saying you have to do to get the results. There are probably some things that I'm wrong on or some things that people will disagree on. You have to use your own best judgment. These have just been kind of what I have uh, gathered from my personal experience grading cards for about four years now. So let's go ahead and get into it. Uh, the first question that I will usually ask in response to one of those questions I just mentioned is what is your intention with the card? And I think this is really crucial to understanding and giving uh, whoever may be asking me that question the best answer possible. So there's two kind of categories that I'll group it into. There are those who want them for their collection, the graded cards, or those who want to resell them when they come back. And I will talk about both of them separately because I think the answer is different depending on what you want to do. Let's start with the former. Say this is for my collection. Then it really kind of boils down to your personal preference. Do you want to have it slabbed for your collection or not? And I say if you want it slabbed, send it in. You know, it's, it's your collection. You enjoy it how you want to. If you don't want it slabbed, don't send it in. Regardless of what anyone tells you, like, oh, you should get this graded or, oh, this needs to be in the slab. Slab it if you want it, slab it if you don't, it's your card. Uh, so I guess a little bit more of an extension of that is what are some of the things that you use to determine if you want to slab a card for your collection, if it's worth it to you. Uh, some of the pros and cons that I would personally weigh just from submitting cards of my own is number one, I guess the pro is that it's going to be well protected. It's going to be encapsulated, you know, this, this is plastic here. Uh, it's not going to bend around like a top loader. You have the flip to identify the card at the top. It also has the assigned grades, so you have the condition of the card there. Is this the end-all, be-all for condition? Of course not. There's going to be some cards that are overgraded, some cards that are undergraded. But in general, it's, it's a very good guide as to what the actual condition of the card is. So that is, is one of the benefits, um, well, actually two of the benefits there. Another one here, you can see the cert number at the uh, the bottom right corner. That eight digit number, if I go into the PSA set registry and enter that in and add that to my inventory, then I can utilize this card in all of PSA's set registry features. So uh, if, for example, you're a player collector like myself, I'm showing you a card that would be used in the player collection registry, I can go ahead and enter that in and it's a way to help me kind of catalog my collection if I wanted to do so. Maybe some of you guys out there who like to do the sets, some of you out there who like to have your collection cataloged in a way, it can be a nice feature and you can also kind of track your progress, track uh, you know how much you spend on it if you're trying to budget yourself as well. There are a lot of great features with the PSA set registry and something that I probably need to do a separate video on at a later point in time. Uh, so that's kind of some of the pros. Some of the cons is that you're going to be without this card for probably six months. If you're sending in at the value level, it's going to be a little bit shorter. If you're sending in at one of the higher service levels, especially if you get to the express level or above. But in general, if you're sending below express, you're going to have to probably wait at least 30 days before the card is even going to come back. So are you okay with having it out of your collection for that long? Uh, another point to it as well is that you can't handle the raw card anymore once it's slabbed. Of course, you can always crack it out if you want to, but it's kind of a pain, I would say, a little bit to, to crack it out. I've, I've cracked them out before, and it's not as bad as I, I might be making it out to be, but uh, it's certainly not, I guess, the most enjoyable thing to crack a card out of the slab. And that might also be the case if you get a grade back on your card that maybe you're not happy with. Now, of course, there are ways to kind of circumvent that where the card does not get slabbed if it doesn't meet a certain grade. Uh, and I've, I've done that before too, where I ask for a minimum grade or I ask for no qualifiers. If you're someone who doesn't want a qualifier on your card, you can have that as well. Uh, of course, then if you ask for minimum grades, say, and it doesn't come back at that grade, then you're still out the money that you paid to have the card graded. And at the same time, you're gonna be 
out the card for that amount of time. So it's somewhat of a waste of time and money if you want to look at it like that. I guess that's just kind of one of those things that you have to weigh and, and figure out, is this risk worth it to me? So that is kind of uh, some of the things that I would use if you're going to look for stuff for your collection to grade. So we'll move into the other side of it. This one is a bit more complex, and that's those who want to resell the cards that they get slapped. Uh, some of the benefits is that, number one, you're going to have the card authenticated, and that can be really crucial, especially if you are not the person who is the original owner of the card, and that particularly pertains, I would say, to vintage and submodern as well for maybe some key rookie cards. If you're not the one who pack pulled it, it can definitely help you to make sure that the card is not trimmed, altered, or possibly a counterfeit. So here's an example here. I was not the original owner of this card. It's a 58 Mickey Mantle All-Star. You can see here it's a PSA 2. So is it a grade that's going to wow people? No. But I absolutely love this card. It has a great story behind it. And when I got it, I'm not a vintage expert. I'm not a mantle expert by any means. I just wanted to make sure that nothing had been done to alter the card. And going through PSA was a great way to do that. Now, of course, any grading company, it's not just exclusive to one or the other. So if you're sending to PSA, if you're sending to BGS, if you're sending to SGC, any of them, sometimes they're going to miss things. Maybe they will miss a card that has been trimmed, recolored. Uh, whatever the case may be, they might accidentally slap a uh, fake card. It happens, um, but I would say having those who are considered experts in the industry to verify the authenticity of the card, I do trust their judgment a lot more than I trust mine. I do trust mine as well, and you should always use your own judgment either when slabbing a card yourself or when buying a slabbed card just because it gets uh, slabbed up or just because it, it, gets, it is already slabbed up doesn't necessarily mean it is uh, exactly what the flip indicates, uh, and that goes for any grading company. But it's still nice to have that additional verification, and also on something like Vintage, where maybe there is a lot more variation in the condition, you can get a better sense of what kind of condition the card actually is in, which is definitely very important in a market where you have to think about returns, you have to think about disputes, all of that uh, fun stuff that the sellers just love to deal with. Uh, so something else that you may want to consider is that is it a card that you really just want to have it slapped in general if you're going to sell it and that's kind of what i would put this one into this is a 2003 clear tradition lebron and james rookie you can see here it got a 10 so uh, buying this card raw which is what i did i ended up creating it myself it came back to 10 uh, one of the most obvious benefits of creating a card grade is that if it comes back at 10 it's going to be worth more than it is raw. And it doesn't matter what it is. That is pretty much the universal truth across the board is that it's going to be worth more uh, than the raw price. And in a lot of cases now, a 9 is even worth more than the card is raw, which makes sense to me. A lot of cards that are sold raw are advertised as near mint to mint. If you look at um, some of the major singles sellers out there, regardless of if they do vintage or modern, most of them will not grade a card themselves above uh, near mint to mint. So for example, one that comes to mind is Greg Morris cards. You're not gonna see one that is advertised as gem mint, but it's raw. Uh, most of them will only go up to near mint to mint. And that's what I would say you wanna kind of expect when you're getting a, uh, a card in and it's raw. Probably an eight is fair to say. And if it's anything less than that, then that's probably when a seller would, would wanna disclose any additional information. But an, an eight, I would say is your baseline assumption uh, for a raw card, which is a lot of times why a nine is more expensive. For this one right here, uh, I had several copies of this one, and it's just one of those that you, you just wanna have graded. Um, it verifies the authenticity of the card. Not that this one is heavily counterfeited per se, but it's definitely one of those that is valuable enough where people could possibly seek to counterfeit it. Um, how easy it is to counterfeit this particular card, I'm not familiar enough with a lot of the nuances, just some of the basic things. I would say this is probably a, an easier card than your average like Chromium card to, uh, to replicate or make some kind of counterfeit of. So to have it verified and graded is definitely something that's really great. If I'm selling this card on the secondary market, uh, this is a very sought after card and it's a very valuable card as well. You got to think about your buyer in the situation. They are going to be spending a lot of money with you uh, on some of these graded cards potentially. And you want to make sure that they are satisfied with their purchase, not just so that they're happy. I mean, you, you should want your buyer to be happy with what they bought, 
Uh, but you should also you know, keep in mind that you're protecting yourself as well. You're taking the additional steps to protect yourself uh, from chargebacks, from, from all that kind of stuff, PayPal disputes, whatever the case may be. So that is definitely something to consider. Uh, and, and this is the type of card that I would say is, is kind of more of a slam dunk. Uh, yeah, you want to grade it. Now, what you'll also have to kind of think about is what does the market on that card look like right now? And what does the market on that card figure to look like when you want to get it back? So again, going back to what I said about collecting, if you're doing it uh, to resell, you kind of have to consider at least at the value service level, which is the, the bulk submissions, what is the card going to look like? And I usually say six months from now. So let's take, for example, this raw card right here. This is a Justin Herbert Prism Rookie. Uh, let's pretend that I sent this off today to PSA. I will probably get it back sometime in July or August, which is going to be kind of in the heart of NFL training camp or the preseason. So it will be the start of Herbert's second year. Now, I can't really foresee anything that would cause this to go down. It's going to come back at a time where there's going to be more interest in football cards. Generally, interest starts to peak towards the uh, dog days of summer once training camp starts, and then usually by Labor Day weekend, uh, football cards really kind of climb up for their mid-season uh, prices, if you will. So if you look at this Justin Herbert card, uh, it's a base rookie, and if Herbert becomes what a lot of people think he's going to become after a pretty great rookie season, then this is going to be kind of the base rookie to have. It's the prism rookie. Uh, it's the, essentially the flagship rookie for NFL cards these days. Uh, now let's say that he has a terrible second year, and all of a sudden the prices on these plummet. Well, that's something that you kind of have to consider, um, that his hobby may look different now. To tell you a little bit of the story, in my very first submission that I sent off, well, no, it wasn't the first one, I apologize. It was uh, it was one of the first ones. There was a Jimmy Garoppolo stack of SP Authentic Rookies that I had sold uh, later on down the line. And after I had sent them in, they were sent in in April of 2018. So you got to think around that time, it was after he would, be, would have been traded to the 49ers. And he was 6-0 and when he first went to the 49ers. This guy was nuclear in the hobby. And it was also kind of before you had guys like uh, Mahomes. I mean, Mahomes had just he'd only started one game at that point. So uh, it was right after the NFL draft when the Baker Mayfield, Lamar Jackson class was drafted. So none of those cards were really on the market yet because they hadn't been made yet. Uh, and if, if you look at that, Garoppolo was by far the hottest young name in the football hobby. Well, by the time that they came back, which was a little bit after Labor Day, I want to say it was mid-September, it was right after Garoppolo had torn his ACL in week three, and he really had, excuse me, there, I accidentally knocked the camera. Uh, he really hadn't played that well in the first couple weeks of the season, and those cards probably dropped 70% of the value from what they were going for from when I sent them in to when I eventually got them back. Not great. So that is definitely something that you want to consider. Let, let that uh, mistake that I kind of made be, be a lesson learned if you're looking to send something in to resell. Now, with the base rookies as well, some people will talk about the pop reports. Well, let's talk about the pop reports in terms of what you're looking to, uh, you know, what you're looking for when you're looking at a pop report. To me, I would not put a lot of stock into how many of the cards are graded, and then not consider anything else along with it. Uh, for example, there are 5,000-plus Mike Trout 2011 Tops Update PSA 10s. And I can tell you that there are definitely more than 5,000-plus people in the hobby who would like to own that card. So the demand is certainly there. It's one that matches it. Now, say, for example, <clears throat> excuse me, the Zion Williamson card, I think there's over 10,000 PSA 10s for his Prism base rookie. Is there enough demand for that? Well, based on the prices, I would say yes. There is still enough demand for the Zion Williamson Prism. And if you're going to move it right away, then you probably won't have too much problem with it. Now, say let's say that Zion is a bust. I'm not saying one way or the other. I don't, I'm not going to put my opinion on what, he, what I think he's going to do. Let's just pretend, and you can replace him with John Morant, you can replace him with R.J. Barrett, Luca, 
Trey Young, whichever hot young NBA name that you want to go with here. Let's say that something happens and maybe their career ended today because of some season or career ending in, career ending injury, excuse me. Well, then those cards are, are going to plummet uh, in price because they really, in, in the long term of things, they're probably going to be guys who are forgotten, unfortunately, especially uh, in terms of the hobby. Of course, if, if you look at baseball, for example, I'm a Tigers fan personally. A guy like Mark Fidrich has a fantastic following. He really only played one full season. It was fantastic, but he got hurt, and he was never really the same after that, and he faded out of the league after a couple of years. So they'll def- those types of guys, they'll have a, a special place in the heart of collectors, but it's not going to be kind of what you were probably expecting it to be when you send it in. So that is, uh, that is definitely something that you want to consider. So for me, usually I will wait a couple of years on a base rookie. So this is not something that I will grade. Unless I think a guy is kind of a slam dunk, you know, no doubt about it. Like a, a Patrick Mahomes, for example, in 2018, about halfway through that season, if I add one of his silver prisms, which there are no base cards, or the base is the silver prism for 17, I would have sent it in uh, just because I, I, I believed in him at that time. And I still do. Uh, He's he's definitely proven himself even more so. Uh, So that is something else and that I usually will consider is that I'll put it in a safe place, make sure the card is nothing happens to it. Uh, But if I am really high on a guy that maybe I want to take a look at it, I will grade it later on down the line when that guy is more proven and maybe there's a little bit more stability with his career where if something does happen to him, people aren't necessarily going to turn their back on, we'll say, in the hobby. Uh, Something that I would more so look to grade if I am going to grade a rookie like that would be something like this. This is the laser prism of Justin Herbert. So this is something here where it's more expensive in terms of, uh, because it's a parallel, and it's a little bit more scarce than the base prism. Now, there are still plenty of these out there. If you wanted to go find one on eBay right now, you have plenty of options. The thing about it is that they're not necessarily cheap. So uh, to have it graded, I think, is nice if, if you know if Herbert does take off eventually like the rookie registries will be a thing with him if uh, if he's a player that people want to player collect then this is definitely a card that they'll want to have slabbed for their collection for the PSA registries the registry effect is definitely real and sometimes I will target cards that are in popular PSA registries to grade because well people are gonna want them for the registries and that's again just being able to identify the secondary market but it's one of those that isn't as common so uh, very rarely will i send in a base card there are some exceptions and i'll show you one here in a minute actually one that i'll be submitting here in january uh but if i'm going to submit a guy like herbert for example i'm going to usually look to one of the parallel cards at least like a refractor or a silver prison which is kind of your most basic parallel that might be something that i look at all right another uh another example here if i'm going to look to submit a base card Uh, in terms of veteran base cards in in the secondary market. These really aren't something that have been, up until the last year, something that are extremely profitable if you're a flipper, per se. Uh, Having the PSA 10s, of course, people will always be interested in PSA 10 Brady's, LeBron's, Michael Jordan's, all of your all-time greats types. Uh, They're they're definitely going to be sought after. So for what is essentially a flagship card of Tom Brady, I think this is definitely a card that, that is worth sending in if you think uh, if you think it has a shot at a 10. This one is just a little bit off-center, but everything else looks good. I, I think the centering isn't enough to uh, to dock it. Uh, even in a 9, I would be happy with it. So I'm going to go ahead and send it in because I know there are a lot of Brady collectors out there. It's also his first Bucks card, which is something that's a little bit extra. I think that's, that's kind of cool. Well, his first Bucks Prism card, I should say. He's been in a few products prior to this. Uh, now let's let's talk about the grade with it. So I expect this to be a 10, or at least that is what I am thinking it is going to get. Realistically, I'm going to expect this to come back a 9. And that is definitely what I will use to kind of, uh, I guess, keep tabs on, my, uh, on myself and, and make sure that I'm not sending in something that I'm going to be disappointed if it comes back lower. So uh, what I usually will do is I will ask myself, what do I think the card will be graded? And this is absolutely crucial, I will say, is that you have to do this objectively. You, there's no way to will a card into a grade. If, uh, if you buy a blaster or prism, regardless if you find it in retail or buy it on the secondary market, 
and you pull a big card, it doesn't necessarily mean that it, it's going to be a 10 because you, you found the box, you bought the box, and you opened the box, and you pulled the card yourself. Not all cards that come out of the ten, that come out of the packs are 10s. In fact, if you sent in every card that you got out of a pack, I would venture to say probably less than 30% would come back as 10s. That's just kind of the nature of the beast. Maybe a little bit more, but especially on some of these like chromium type products where there is stuff like uh, print lines or roller lines, whatever the case may be. Those are definitely very real things that you just can't really avoid out of the pack. Sometimes they're scratching uh, on the surface. So it's definitely not an automatic 10. It's just one of those things that you kind of have to be honest with yourself uh, when you're sending it in. And my general rule of thumb is that if it is considering everything else, if I get it back in six months from now and it's one grade lower than what I'm expecting, so in this case a PSA 9, am I okay with that? And It's going to be $15 to grade this ultra modern card. Am I okay with that? And my answer is yes. Now if I'm just sending in this card on my own, Maybe not so much, but I do have more cards in the order that can kind of pull this one up. So that is something else I see very common as well, is that some people will send in a few cards to sell to help pay for their submission. And I think that is fantastic. If you can get your own cards basically graded for free because you sold something else that maybe you didn't necessarily want that you also got graded, that's fantastic. And I, I know a lot of people who do that. Um, if you are someone who's going to do that, I guess just the one thing you want to make sure of is that the card that you are sending in uh, is actually profitable where it is covering those grading costs. The last thing that you want to happen is to have the card uh, end up costing you additional money because it doesn't sell for even the grading fee that you paid to get it slabbed up and now you're into it for even more. And on top of that, you have to uh, you have to get your own cards. You, know, you have to pay for them basically out of pocket rather than using that card to pay for it. So I know this was very in-depth. This was a long video and there was a lot more that I probably could have rambled on about this topic with. But if you have any tips of your own that you like to share for what you guys like to do in the comments down below, I would love to hear them. I'll probably learn a thing or two because I'm constantly learning things uh, in regards to grading. I've, I've done it for quite some time uh, and I, I learn something new every single submission that I do. And that's good because if I was too complacent, well, that would, that would bode very poorly for me. So, again, let me know what you think down below. And hopefully this video was helpful to you. Uh, if not, well, I'm very sorry. But I'll be sure to see you guys next time. Until then, take care, stay safe, be kind.